Yesterday, we published our video on Shield AI's new XBAT VTOL drone fighter, and I've gotten a lot of great questions about it on social media that I dove into trying to answer last night. In particular, people seem to be really concerned with the idea of using cargo ships to launch fighter drones, because that could paint a target on civilian vessels. I also got a lot of comments from folks who just didn't believe that the XBAT really could take off and land vertically, as depicted and Shield AI's promotional materials. So, since I already set about making these video responses, I thought I might try something a little different and just put them together in one video that addresses both questions. Just don't mind the outfit change halfway through. So, here are a few of your questions about Shield AI's new XBAT drone fighter, answered to the best of my ability with the limited information we have available. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is a brief air power Q&A. Is it even really possible for the XBAT to take off and land like that? So Shield AI's new XBAT drone fighter is designed to take off and land vertically, sort of like a SpaceX rocket, using just a single jet engine. And that is a pretty groundbreaking capability, so I understand why a lot of folks are reluctant to believe that it's even possible. But the truth is, it's not just possible, it's already been done in a different drone that is already in service. Anderil's Roadrunner M which is a unique type of UAV that I would describe as a recoverable air defense interceptor or missile. You see, most air defenses shoot down incoming missiles or drones or aircraft with interceptors that are just missiles themselves that were designed to close with airborne targets. And it isn't uncommon to launch multiple interceptors at a single inbound threat to make sure you hit it. But once one interceptor finds its mark, the rest become wasted ordnance. But not with Roadrunner. Rather than being powered by a rocket like a single-use missile, Roadrunner is powered by two small air-breathing turbojet engines, like a cruise missile or a small fighter. Now, this kind of propulsion system, combined with Anderil's Lattice Autonomy software and Roadrunner's onboard sensors, allowed the weapon to take off and close with an inbound threat and then identify it to determine if it needs to be shot down. If it is a real threat, Roadrunner closes with it and detonates its onboard blast fragmentation warhead to take it out. But if another interceptor gets there first, or if the object turns out not to be a threat at all, Roadrunner can just turn around and fly home, landing vertically again to be refueled and reused. Now, these systems have already seen combat with SOCOM, or the Special Operations Command, and they're currently being added to the air defense suite of the Gerald R. Ford Carrier Strike Group. Now, just like Shield AI's XBAT, Roadrunner is a tail sitter, meaning this roughly six-foot-tall drone takes off and lands with its nose pointed at the sky. And just like the XBAT's launch recovery vehicles, or LRVs, Roadrunner can return to its Nest automated hangar, which is marketing speak for a fancy box. Now, in order for the XBAT drone fighter to be able to take off and land vertically in the same way, well, they really only need to nail down three things. The first is sufficient thrust, the second is flight control for stability, and the third is a design that can withstand vertical thrust. So let's take those one at a time and see if we can't draw some reasonable conclusions about how Shield AI can crack these nuts. And first up is sufficient thrust. Now, Shield AI has not disclosed the engine that will power the XBAT, but as I've mentioned before, the engine shown in the testing footage they sent me looks a lot like a GE F414, and that is a pretty darn capable power plant with the ability to pump out about 13,000 pounds of thrust dry and 22,000 pounds of thrust under afterburner. Now, in order to take off vertically, you just need a vertical thrust to weight ratio that's better than one to one, meaning for every pound of weight, you need more than one pound of thrust in order to get airborne. Now, we see that the XBAT is using its afterburner on takeoff, which means it's got about 22,000 pounds of thrust pouring out of that tail. We don't know exactly how much the XBAT weighs, but it is a lot smaller than an F-16 and, importantly, doesn't have a cockpit or any other pilot support equipment, making it a 
pretty safe bet that it weighs well under 20,000 pounds. So we know it's got the power to get airborne. Up next is flight control, and that can be a tough nut to crack, but today's fly-by-wire flight control systems are capable of making rapid adjustments to control surfaces in fractions of a second. In fact, in jets like the F-22 Raptor, the pilot isn't really flying the aircraft at all. They provide simple input via the control stick, and then an advanced flight control computer translates that into the countless movements across different control surfaces it needs to both compensate for the aircraft's natural instability and to make the jet do what you tell it to do. Without those computers, a pilot probably wouldn't even be able to make a Raptor fly in a straight line. Likewise, the F-35B uses its flight control computer to hover nice and level rather than fighting the wobble that you'd often see in Harriers. And it is worth noting that the F-35B lands vertically, again, with just a single engine. And as we've seen from firms like Anduril and SpaceX, flight control computers capable of managing nose-up vertical takeoffs and landings absolutely already exist. And that just leaves a design that can withstand vertical thrust. Now, in fighters like the F-35B, that's a challenge because the aircraft was designed to fly forward through the air, not up. And that means it needs to be reinforced to some extent to withstand vertical takeoffs and landings. But tail sitters like the X-Bat and Roadrunner don't really need to worry about that because they take off oriented in the same direction that they fly. So, long story short, I don't see any reason why Shield AI couldn't build the XBAT exactly as depicted in these videos. The tech already exists and is even already in service, but that's still no guarantee that they'll be successful. Like just about any defense initiative, the engineers can make it happen just as long as the money faucet doesn't shut off. Wouldn't it be illegal to use cargo ships to launch combat aircraft? Now, this might be the scariest thing that you learned today, but just about every country you can think of already has missile launchers disguised as good old-fashioned shipping containers that they can slap onto the deck of any old cargo ship. Now, yesterday, I brought up how Shield AI's new multi-role drone fighter, the Expat, could be launched from cargo ships, and that caught the attention of some folks who pretty justifiably wondered if that's a violation of some kind of law. And the answer to that question is a little murky, in part because international laws aren't exactly real. There is no universally recognized international police force to enforce international law. So to some extent, enforcement becomes a question of economic and diplomatic pressure applied by other nations. And as we've seen with countries like Russia, there are real limits to what that pressure can actually do. But more to the point, there's nothing illegal about using civilian vessels in wartime. They just lose their civilian immunity under international humanitarian law. Now, you're not supposed to try to fool your adversary into thinking a ship is part of a protected class, like a hospital ship or a third-party merchant vessel, but even when countries do that, it's often considered what's usually called a lawful ruse of war. But more broadly speaking, I don't think many people realize just how active a role merchant ships and cargo vessels play in large-scale war. Despite usually being crewed and operated by civilians, merchant ships are the logistical lifeblood of most war efforts. And as a result, anytime large-scale war breaks out, these civilian vessels start sailing with a very big target on their back. During World War II, as one good example, between a combined 7,000 and 8,000 large-hold merchant ships were sunk by all parties. And when you include smaller auxiliary vessels and the like, the total merchant ship sunk skyrockets to as high as 30,000. Now, in a large-scale fight for survival, severing enemy supply lines any way you can just becomes an important ingredient for victory. Or, you know, even just surviving. But in recent years, nations have begun fielding weapon systems disguised as shipping containers for a wide variety of reasons. 
Russia's Club K system disguises anti-ship and land attack variants of their caliber cruise missiles in 20 and 40 foot standard shipping containers. China, as usual, has what is effectively just an improved copy of the Club K and their containerized sea defense combat system designed to launch a variety of Chinese cruise missiles and even anti-radiation missiles to target active radar arrays. Israel has the LoRa, which launches ballistic missiles from standard shipping containers, and they demonstrated this on the deck of a cargo ship back in 2017. Turkey has their own system that they describe as, quote, designed for maximum concealment that carries six Kara et Maka cruise missiles. The Royal Netherlands has their own version, as does Iran, and of course, you know Uncle Sam's getting in on this too, with MLRS-style guided rocket and missile launchers tucked away inside their own unassuming-looking standard shipping containers. And not that long ago, the Navy demonstrated its ability to launch an SM-6 interceptor from a shipping container on the deck of an uncrewed drone vessel. Now, part of the reason behind these shipping container missile systems is, of course, logistics. It's just easier to transport standard shipping containers, and these systems allow you to stick missiles on literally anything with some deck space. But being able to hide in plain sight is also a very big part of this equation. There are around 55,000 active merchant ships in the world today, and regardless of the vessel's nation of origin, about 80% of all the shipping containers that you'll find on them come from one of three manufacturers in China. Now, the United States has 360 medium to large commercial ports for a total of anywhere between 1 and 2,000 cargo ships birthed in American ports at any given time, usually with a one to three day cycling or turnaround rate. Now, these ports, of course, also happen to be located near major highway and rail infrastructure for further shipping. They're near American military installations and, of course, population centers because, you know, cities tend to crop up along the coast, especially in places with calm harbors. So, if World War III were to kick off anytime soon, you can rest assured that cargo ships would actually be seeing plenty of action. 